Hello everyone. What I want to talk about in the next two videos um, are linear uh, functionals and reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces. In particular, uh, I want to talk about uh, reproducing kernels for the Bergman space. Um, right, so uh, what's a linear functional? Um, well, uh, a linear functional is uh, just a functional, meaning it's a map from a normed vector space X uh, into, well, the reals or the complex numbers, depending on whether you have a vector space over the reals or the complex numbers. Um, that's linear. Right? So yeah, we say if this is true, this is a linear uh, functional. Okay, so we define a norm uh, and well, sometimes this norm isn't uh, finite, so maybe I should not call it a norm, but anyway, um, that's all right. It's just like calling, you know, saying the LP norm of a function that maybe is not an LP because, you know, you, you, know, the, you integrate the modulus of it raised to the P that equals infinity. Well, it's not really too much of an abuse of uh, vocabulary to, you know, to say, you know, they call it the, you know, LP norm of a function, even though it's uh, infinity. But anyway, so yeah, we define this LP norm, or this rather norm here on a linear functional to be the soup over all of these where the norm is less than or equal to one. So by definition, we say a, a linear functional uh, is bounded if this is finite. Okay, um, and so, uh, let's prove the following very useful elementary, but nevertheless incredibly useful um, proposition. And that is um, if we have a linear functional, and I'm just using the book's notation here. So, uh, right, so LF for linear functional. So the following are equivalent. First of all, um, this is continuous. Uh, just continuous in the sense of this being a map between two metric spaces. Um, uh, basically because of the fact that this is linear, continuity is the same as continuity at zero. And that's the same as saying this is a bounded linear functional. All right, so let's prove this. Well, there's nothing to prove A implies B. If it's continuous, that means it's continuous at all points. So certainly it means it's continuous at zero. So nothing to prove there. Uh, let's prove B implies C. Well, it's fairly clear that you plug in zero to a linear functional, you get zero um, just because, well, zero is zero plus zero. Use linearity. So subtract, you can cancel uh, one of these. So this is going to be. Um, Zero. All right. So let's use continuity at zero. So 
So really, um, yeah, just use the definition of continuity. For any epsilon bigger than zero, there exists delta depending on epsilon, where, um, well, just by definition, this here is less than epsilon. If the norm X minus zero is less than or equal to Delta. Well, so this is zero. So this is really, I'll move this over. It's really just this right here. And of course this is X minus zero is X. So this is really what continuity at zero um, means. Okay. <clears throat> so let's say set epsilon to be one. We really could set epsilon to be anything you want, but let's just set it to be one. Um, Okay, so for X not equal to zero and the norm of X less than or equal to one, uh, let's um, just use a little, little trick. So I'm going to um, inside this linear functional, basically, um, multiply and divide by the norm of X over Delta. So here Delta is just Delta of one because Epsilon is one. So, uh, right, so it's norm of X over Delta times X norm, uh, sorry, X times Delta over norm of X. And the point here is that what I'm circling has norm less than or, well, it has norm equal to Delta. So it's certainly less than or equal to Delta. Okay. But what I'm gonna circle here by linearity, I can pull out. Oops. So I'll pull it out. Well, this is going to be less than right here is less than or equal to one. Because again, we're setting epsilon B1. And for what's in red, that's certainly true. It, the norm is equal to delta. Uh, maybe make this a little smaller so it'll fit. So that's just less than or equal to norm of X over Delta. Okay. Um, right. And last but not least, well, norm of X, um, right. Norm of X is less than or equal to one. So, uh, right, what does this mean? We picked an arbitrary X not equal to zero. When we plug in zero, this is zero. So we pick an arbitrary X not equal to zero with norm less than or equal to one. We found that Delta to the minus one uh, where Delta is this right here for epsilon equals one is an upper bound for this, all these numbers here for X uh, being less than or equal to one and norm. So we have just proved that by definition, this norm here is less than or equal to delta to the minus one because this norm uh, by definition is the supremum uh, over all X with norm less than or equal to one. Okay, soup is the least upper bound. Delta to the minus one is an upper bound. So the least upper bound 
It's less than or equal to this upper bound. All right, so last but not least, let's do C implies A. Um, so if the norm of X minus Y is not equal to zero, so in other words, if X is not equal to uh, Y, then uh, let's just look at this here. So by linearity, we're actually going to prove Lipschitz continuity. Um, so this is x minus y. Uh, so I'll use linearity again in following uh, not too subtle way. So basically multiply and divide, or, or rather kind of bring in this x minus y, cancel. Uh, let me do that on the next page. It's not going to fit here. Sorry about that. Right, so bring in this norm x minus y inside, and that'll cancel this norm of x minus y to get exactly what we have here. Okay, well, um, right. So certainly what I'm circling in red, again, has norm less than or equal to one. The norm, um, well, the norm is one. So this is going to be less than or equal to X minus Y in norm times, well, by definition, this is a supreme, this is an upper bound of all of these when I plug in stuff with norm less than or equal to one. And so that proves continuity. You know, it actually proves Lipschitz continuity with Lipschitz constant being uh, the norm of my linear functional, my bounded linear function. Okay. So that takes care of the proof. All right, so um, just a definition, and we'll explore this more later on. Um, so I did use uh, for a norm vector space x star for the completion. Um, maybe that wasn't such a good idea, but from now on x star uh, will denote the dual space of a normed vector space. And what is that? By definition, that's just the space, the vector space of all bounded linear functionals. On X, um, right. So yeah, in other words, it's a set of all linear maps from X to C that are bounded Um, so as we'll see later, this actually is a Bonnock space, regardless of whether or not X is complete or not. Um, it's not very hard to show. Um, yeah, and this is called the dual space of X. All right, so, right, so this is definitely something we're going to explore later on more in detail. For now, let's compute the dual space of a Hilbert space. Um, and it's not, it's, I wouldn't say it's not interesting, but it's quite straightforward, which makes Hilbert spaces absolutely wonderful to work in and makes non-Hilbert spaces challenging to work in. Okay, so, um, just a note. So um, if we're in a Hilbert space, then automatically we're furnished with um, 
a whole ton of uh, bounded linear functionals. In particular, if I fix an H0 in a Hilbert space H, um, and let's say H0 is not equal to zero, then let's set a linear functional to be the following. And you can check this is linear, really just linearity of the inner product. Um, Yeah, so we're you know we're defining this uh, linear functional in the following way. Okay, so I claim this is a bounded linear functional, and that's just really the Cauchy Schwartz inequality. So by Cauchy Schwartz, this is going to be the norm of h less than or equal to norm of h norm of h zero. And that's less than or equal to the norm of H0 if, um, well, this has norm less than or equal to one. So that certainly implies that this is a bounded linear functional. And the norm by definition is uh, less than or equal to uh, the norm of H0. On the other hand, um, well, let's plug in uh, the following to see that the norm is the norm of H0. So in other words, this, uh, this norm here for this bounded linear functional is the norm of H0. How do we see that? Well, plug in something very convenient, not too subtle. That's H0 over norm H0. H0 is not zero. I mean, if H0 is zero, then this is just the zero functional. Plug in any H, you get zero back. Uh, right, so this here, what I'm circling, uh, obviously has norm one. Okay, so it's the norm is less than or equal to one. So this is going to be equal to, um, just dump it in, H0 over norm H0, H0. So this is going to be norm H0. So it implies the supremum is a maximum and the maximum occurs at this point, this element here of your Hilbert space. Um, and what I'm doing right now really doesn't require completeness, of course. Uh, I've not used completeness here. Uh, so as long as we have an inner product space, um, every element in your inner product space defines a bounded linear functional. Um, so yeah, sorry, write this down. Right, okay, so let's prove the following theorem which is called the Reese representation theorem. Um, and yeah, I've actually heard some fairly hilarious anecdotes about uh, the mathematician Reese, uh, kind of a party animal of sorts. Um, I'll look into those. Uh, but anyway, uh, he, he was a mathematician in the early 1900s, uh, like 1910, 1920s. Um, so yeah, this is called the Rees representation theorem. And what does this say? Uh, this says that basically the only bounded linear functionals are these bounded linear functions. So if I have something, and you really can't overstate how important this result is. It's not hard to prove, but um, I mean, this is just so foundational. Um, I mean, you can prove existence of, uh, you know, solutions to partial differential equations using this. You can prove 
uh, prove a lot of things with this result. And I probably will give that as a homework, uh, maybe, uh, if not the next homework, the one after, where you apply this in a very elementary way with your Hilbert space being a Sobolev space, at least to get uh, uh, existence of solutions to differential equations kind of as your starting point. Um, anyway, so, and here H has to be a Hilbert space. So I want to emphasize that. Uh, sorry about that. We absolutely do need completeness. Whereas here, as I mentioned, we just need an inner product space. Okay, uh, yeah. If we have something in the dual space of H, then there exists unique H zero, where um, this bounded linear functional is given by, well, this very special bounded linear functional. And as powerful as this is, the proof is surprisingly uh, straightforward. I, you know, really the hard work um, is uh, done already. Uh, we did it in the last uh, video. <clears throat> okay, um, right. So first of all, let's get, uh, get rid of the easy case of uh, this being just the trivial linear functional. Well, all you do is set H zero to be zero. And then you have this linear functional is going to be um, the linear functional. I'll, I'll call this from now on uh, when I'm circling uh, in blue, I'll call this the linear functional induced or the bounded linear functional induced by H zero. Sorry, yeah. If you have the zero functional, then well, that's given by the bounded linear functional induced by zero, right? Uh, also, let's just get rid of uh, uniqueness Get that out of the way. So in general, regardless of what H zero is, if uh, so if I have a bounded linear functional that's given by the bounded linear functional induced by two elements in my Hilbert space, then uh, for any H in my Hilbert space, uh, so Uh, da, 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 da. That. So these are the same. All right, so what is this? Well, you can just check by linearity. This is H um, inner product H zero minus H zero um, prime. So all you do is set H to be, um, uh, well, just, just set H to be H zero minus H zero prime. Uh, and let's see what that gives us. Well, 
well, that uh, you're just gonna get the norm of H zero minus H zero prime squared. So H zero is H zero prime. So not a whole lot to that. Okay, so let's finish, let's prove existence. Okay, um, right, so let's say, uh, let's say M is the kernel which obviously is just the inverse image of the zero you know, singleton. So this is uh, just all H in your Hilbert space, where you dump in uh, H and you get zero. So by linearity, uh, the kernel of any linear map is linear. You know, um, or rather, sorry, the kernel uh, is a subspace because of linearity. Now, um, because this is uh, continuous and obviously um, you know, singleton is closed, it's closed set, the inverse image of a closed set is closed, so M is a closed uh, subspace. <clears throat> and I should say, uh, because we're assuming that this is not the zero functional, we're assuming that, well, maybe, um, Yeah, so let's assume this is not identically zero, meaning that uh, we're assuming that this is not true. So this here, when I write this, that's what I mean by um, this bounded linear functional is identically zero. You plug in anything, you get zero. So assume that you can plug in something and not get zero. So in other words, the kernel is not all of my Hilbert space. So at the end of the last video, what did we prove? We proved that if you have a closed subspace that's not your entire Hilbert space, then uh, there exists something non-zero. Uh, sorry about that, it's black. So you can pick something, let's call it Z, that's in the orthogonal complement of M, okay? <clears throat> and remember, you know, it's, it, I think it's nice to kind of go back and see what, where things come from. Where did this come from? We used the uh, projector theorem to uh, fairly easily get what Z is. And that depended on the projector theorem, depended on the nearest point theorem. So it's kind of the foundation here. Um, nearest point theorem implies projector theorem. Projector theorem gives us the existence of this Z here. Okay. Okay, uh, right. <clears throat> So let's now say Z, uh, beta um, is going to be um, right. So let's say um, beta is uh, this linear functional, bounded linear functional applied to Z. This is not going to be zero. 
for the simple reason that, well, if this was zero, then Z is an M, M is a kernel. So Z is in both M and M perp, M is a subspace, so Z would be zero, but Z is not zero. So because Z is not zero and Z is an M perp, Z cannot be an M. So you plug in Z, you cannot get zero. Sorry, to go here. Okay, so let's set, so Z is not quite my H zero, but we're getting closer. So let's set Z tilde to be um, Z over beta. Okay. So first of all, this is certainly still an M perp because all I'm doing is dividing by a scalar, a non-zero scalar. So Z is an M perp, so Z over beta is an M perp. And by linearity, you can pull out the one over uh, beta. Well, that's just beta over beta. Um, beta is exactly what I'm circling. So this is beta. So uh, this is just going to be one. Okay. So the punchline here is we have an element in M perp that's not zero, and I apply it to my bounded linear functional, I get one. That's really what we need. Okay, so uh, let's finish this up. I claim that my bounded, my arbitrary bounded linear functional is given by the bounded linear and function, bounded linear functional induced by um, Z tilde over um, the norm of Z tilde squared. Okay, so why is that? Well, let's uh, let's prove that. Okay. Um, right. So we have to pick an arbitrary element in my Hilbert space. And we need to prove that, um, well, if I plug it into this here, I get H inner product H zero. So let's, let's see that. Um, <clears throat> so let's set alpha to be uh, my linear functional applied to H. So let's cook up something convenient in um, the kernel of my linear functional, my bounded linear functional, and that I claim is alpha z minus h. Uh, why? Well, let's use linearity. So that's just going to be alpha applied or alpha times linear bounded linear functional applied to Z minus my bounded linear functional with H plugged in. Well, remember, uh, sorry, I want Z tilde. Sorry about that. <clears throat> Not Z, Z tilde. So remember that we proved just a second ago that this here rather computed is maybe maybe a better thing to say. This is going to be equal to one. So this is just well alpha minus my linear bounded linear functional pi to h, and that's obviously zero because alpha is my linear functional with h plugged in. So that implies that this is an M perp, uh, it's an M, 
M is the kernel of my bounded linear functional. <clears throat> Okay, um, and that implies, well, remember uh, this is an M perp, Z tilde. So that means, well, we have something in M perp, we have something in M, and this is really the uh, key here that these two are orthogonal. Uh, sorry, that should be alpha. It looks, I don't know what it looks like, but. All right, and let's see why that's all I need. So this means that zero is the tilde inner product alpha z tilde minus, um, <coughs> excuse me. Uh, uh, what are we doing? Alpha z tilde minus h, sorry about that. Okay, so that's going to be, um, uh, one. yeah, so that's going to be alpha, well, alpha bar, modulus z squared minus um, z tilde inner product h. So bring uh, this here over to the right-hand side. And take complex conjugates, we get that alpha, the norm of z tilde is going to be h z tilde. Well, what does that mean? Remember, um, so that means my linear functional applied to H, my bounded linear functional applied to H, we set it to be alpha, but just solve for alpha here. Well, it's exactly what I want. It's exactly H inner product, H zero, where H zero is this here. So, uh, right. So, Basically, the depth of this proof is exactly um, it's exactly this here. The depth of the proof is exactly that there exists a non-zero element in the orthogonal complement of the kernel. And then you just be a little clever to figure out what H zero has to be basically. All right. And that takes care of the proof. So in the next video, um, I'll do probably what Kehe did in his course, but go probably a lot more into depth. He probably left the details for homework. Um, I'm always surprised at how far he gets in his courses, uh, but. Anyway, yeah, and I'll talk about the Bergman space of the disk. Um, apply this to point evaluation, and talk about um, re, you know, in general reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces, um, which are very useful in, I would say, traditional machine learning. Um, yeah, uh, and if you're interested in applications of this stuff too you know, machine learning, I'd be happy to go over that. I'm very familiar with um, reproducing kernel Hilbert spaces and their applications to machine learning. Um, you know, if you've heard of deep learning, which I'm sure you have, neural networks, uh, they've largely overtaken uh, reproducing kernel Hilbert space methods in machine learning. 
particularly when you have a ton of data, which nowadays, unlike 20 years ago, you do. Um, but anyway, all right. So yeah, that'll be in the next video. Um, so, so long, take care. Bye-bye. Uh,